secret locations all over Britain is the scientific evidence of thousands of unsolved rape cases, some dating back decades. Each of these cold cases means a victim without justice and a rapist who thinks they've cheated the law. But no case is ever truly closed. Today, police teams across the country, armed with the latest advances in DNA profiling, are hunting these criminals down. One of the first cold case rapes to be solved dated back to the 1980s in South Yorkshire. Women were being terrorised and police baffled by a series of brutal rapes. In each case, the attacker took a trophy from his victim, her stiletto heels. For 20 years, the police had no suspects until a DNA breakthrough starts a chain of events leading the police straight to a man who thought he'd escaped his evil past. Good morning, it's Saturday the 2nd of August and you're listening to Radio Hallam. Now here's Lynn Dixon with the news headlines. Police are urgently appealing for witnesses after a brutal sex attack on an 18-year-old woman in the Dern Valley area. 1980s Rotherham, and the town is waking up to the news that yet another young woman had been brutally raped. It's the latest in a series of horrifying crimes. Detective Inspector Sue Hickman was a junior officer with the South Yorkshire Police at the time of the attacks. The first rape happened in February 1983. A lady who was 53 years old, she'd been drinking in the town centre with, uh, with friends and decided to walk the short distance uh, home to where she lived on the outskirts of, uh, of town. The woman was confronted by a man who dragged her into a field. She was bound and gagged and he attempted to rape her, but failed. It was a serious sexual assault. He stole her handbag and blue pointed court shoes. I was a young uh, police officer in Rotherham at that time. I actually got involved in that first enquiry. It was one of the officers that went out and did the fingertip search when, uh, when it was light. We did all the normal inquiries that, uh, that we did back in the 80s, but after a number of uh, weeks, then the inquiry started to wind down because realistically there was nothing else that we could do in relation to it. More than 10 months go by before a similar attack is reported. In December 83, uh, it was a young woman who was 21 years old. She'd been out drinking uh, with her friends. She'd had enough and decided to uh, walk home. She'd almost actually got to uh, got to her home address, and she was grabbed from behind. She had what uh, she felt were uh, stockings uh, placed round her neck. She was actually pulled backwards towards the uh, offender using the uh, soft material, and then dragged into the wasteland where uh, her clothing was actually pulled up over uh, her face, uh, and she was raped. When the attacker left, he took the woman's handbag and both of her black stiletto heel shoes. Deposits of semen were found on clothing recovered from the scene. This attack left the woman unable to trust anyone to this day. Other victims also reported being emotionally scarred. I was so young with my whole life ahead of me. I became a prisoner in my own home. So rape is one step below murder, um, except that the victim has to live through the consequences. It is a lifelong sentence and the fear of going outside, the fear of um, humans in general, of being vulnerable, um, they are devastating consequences. Ten months later, on the 13th of October 1984, a 21-year-old woman is walking home from a nightclub in the early hours of Saturday morning. 
she saw a man hanging uh, hanging about uh, and then the next thing he was behind her and he grabbed her the attacker told the woman he was an out-of-work miner and just wanted her money in reality he wanted much more the victim said that he wasn't able to actually get an erection and so uh, what he finished up doing after uh, some time was actually uh, masturbating onto uh, onto her leg just two weeks later, less than a mile from the previous rape, another attack takes place. This time, a 25-year-old woman is dragged into a public toilet. I was just thinking, what's going to happen? I just want to get out of this alive. All I said was, don't hurt me. During the assault, one of the victim's black stilettos comes off, and the attacker carefully replaces it on the woman's foot before raping her. Twice. I was never the same person afterwards. I wanted to forget it or try to anyway. I had to blank it out, otherwise I couldn't have coped. I didn't know who he was and have always been looking over my shoulder. Once again, he stole the shoes and the woman's jewelry. Obviously, by this stage, we've realized that uh, we've got a serial uh, offender here because of the similarities in the MO. He's taking the uh, shoes, he's taking jewellery, he's taking handbags, he's tying the women, uh, women up. The women had described him as a white male aged between 18 and 25. He had a local accent and an average height and build. He was targeting women returning from nights out. Was he attracted by the high heels? In almost all of the attacks, he wore a stocking mask. Yet the women were able to create a photo fit image of a man now termed the shoe rapist. The local press began to cover the case and the police issued warnings to women not to go out alone at night. Everybody was worried about uh, walking home. Um, the girls didn't walk home like they uh, had done previously, made sure that you were in, uh, you were in groups. By October 1984, four women had been attacked, so the police try a high-risk strategy. We decided at that stage that we'd set a, a decoy uh, up, and uh, I finished up dressed in a, a miniskirt and stiletto shoes, actually walking uh, the route. Very scary, because uh, the sole purpose of doing it was actually to try and get attacked. And we wouldn't be able to do it in this day and age, health and safety, you know, you'd be stopped from doing it. But back in the 80s, that's the sort of thing that we actually uh, did to try and catch offenders. The Forensic Science Service also becomes involved. In the 1980s, the standard procedure for all rape cases was to take swabs from the victim and fibre tapings from her clothing. Semen samples found on clothing were preserved along with fibres and stored on microscope slides. 20 years later, this was to prove crucial to solving the case. We looked at the uh, sex offenders in the area, we traced them, we interviewed uh, them and tried to eliminate them from, uh, from the offences. By Christmas 1984, both the police and forensic teams were working flat out to catch the attacker before he could strike again. But that's exactly what he did on the 22nd of December. This time switching locations eight miles north of Rotherham to the picturesque village of Hoyland. The girl who was just 18 years old was dragged into a field, bound and subjected to a four minute brutal rape. There were a massive amount of inquiries, press appeals and everything uh, done in relation to the offence. Despite police efforts, no suspect is identified. The shoe rapist is seemingly striking at will. The officers who worked on the cases originally were primarily from the Rotherham area, so this had a massive impact on us. Very uh, frustrating after all the uh, time and energy we'd put into it to not be able to give these women some closure and identify who the offender uh, was. The female population of Rotherham was gripped with fear, and the fact that he wasn't caught haunted the women he'd attacked. Not knowing your attacker means you don't know what to look out for, you don't know um, who to be scared of, who you need to protect yourself from. So it's, you know, I guess a lifelong fear of the unknown. I was terrorised. I just couldn't believe he was free walking the streets. The fact that he wasn't caught ruined my life. 
and it was really frightening times in uh, in Rotherham at that stage because uh, we'd now got this big series of offences. We hadn't uh, any ideas who was uh, committing these offences, and we didn't know when they were going to strike next or with what violence they were going to use next. For the whole of 1985, there were no shoe rapist attacks, but he hadn't given up. He was about to strike again, this time with even more brutal violence. In the 1980s South Yorkshire, for three years a brutal serial rapist has been terrorising women in the town of Rotherham. By 1986 he'd attacked at least five women. Now named the Shoe Rapist, the only thing the police knew for certain was that he had a fetish for high-heeled shoes. After a year of no attacks, Suddenly, he strikes again, this time with more violence than ever before. Sue Hickman, now a detective inspector, worked on the original case as a young WPC. She takes us back to the scene of his most brutal crime to date. So the victim had actually been out with friends to a local public house, was on her way back to her boyfriend's address in this area. walked through the estate without any problems whatsoever. He's dragged her for uh, five, six hundred yards through the housing estate. And I mean, as you can see, it's, uh, it's a built-up area. So when we did the house-to-house -house inquiries, there were a number of people who said they'd actually heard muffled screaming. But they thought it was the kids playing and they didn't actually do anything about it. He threatens her with a knife, uh, he hits her, uh, she, uh, she manages to break free and thinks she's going to be able to run away, but he catches her again and, uh, and hits her again. So it, it's a really nasty, violent, uh, violent offence. He actually dragged her uh, into here so that she was away from the houses so nobody could uh, hear her screaming and then started uh, tying her up using, uh, using stockings. She was, uh, she was gagged and she fought right the way through trying to get away from this man because uh, she knew what was going to, uh, going to happen. The attacker taunted the 18-year-old girl and then raped her. He told me, I'm going to have sexual intercourse with you. He used those exact words and then he raped me. It's a really, really nasty, vicious, uh, vicious attack. Yet again, he fled the scene taking the girl's black stiletto shoes with him. All rape survivors will take different amounts of time to heal, some um, maybe a year or two, um, some it can be a lifetime, and I do think rape is a lifelong sentence. When we came back to do the fingertip search in the area, we found the stockings that had been used to tie her up, we found rope that had been used to tie her up, and we found a number of bits of her property that had actually been stolen by him, but obviously left, uh, left behind. While conducting the fingertip search of the crime scene, the police discover what could be a crucial piece of evidence. A man's gold signet ring. Could it have been lost during the rape? Could this ring belong to the shoe rapist? The violence with each of the offences had, uh, has had increased and uh, when you get to this stage and we're talking about a knife being, uh, being used, we really did think that somebody was going to finish it with some very serious injuries if we didn't actually uh, find out who this man was. But by January 1987, the police still had no suspects and no one had identified the signet ring. The case was going cold. Months passed and the case got even colder, when the rape attack seemingly stopped. He suddenly seemed to stop, there was no more, uh, no more offences reported, uh, we'd no idea why this person had stopped. We looked at people who'd gone to prison, people who uh, had uh, died in uh, suicide or any other way to try and you know, identify why these offences had suddenly stopped. 
Um, but we never, uh, we never knew why they'd stop. They just did stop. For more than three years, the shoe rapist terrorised the women of Rotherham. He'd carried out at least six rapes and sexual assaults. The police had no idea who he was. He'd simply vanished. As with all police inquiries, after a set time, when you've done everything you reasonably can, then the inquiry uh, closes down, the incident room closes down, and then every so many years, then we will have a look at it again and see if there's anything uh, fresh that will give us the answer. The year is 2001. It's not only the town of Rotherham that's changed, Police procedures have improved and forensic science has been revolutionised by the development of a whole new technique, DNA profiling. It was a very exciting time because we suddenly had some technology that allowed us to discriminate between people much, much more effectively than before. Cathy Turner is a consultant forensic scientist, currently leading cold case reviews for the Forensic Science Service. DNA really has advanced over the last 20 or so years. Uh, it's become more robust, it's become much more sensitive, which means that we can go back to very old materials and we can test very tiny amounts of starting materials. Every one of us has a chemical molecule in every cell of our bodies that identifies each of us as an individual. It determines our sex, our height, and even our hair and eye colour. Deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA. By 1987, forensic scientists were using DNA to create genetic fingerprints in criminal cases, just a year after the shoe rapist had disappeared. Because DNA is found in every cell of our body, blood, sweat, saliva and semen stains left behind at the scene of a crime can be examined to determine the chemical identity of who they belong to. As techniques improved, forensic teams realised that the samples from unsolved rape cases, stored long before DNA was in use, might contain minute traces of the rapist's semen, sealed within fibre and hair tapings. From this, they may be able to extract the DNA of the attacker. In 2000, South Yorkshire Police approached the Forensic Science Service to see whether or not, given this new technology that we had available to us, this, this DNA processing that we have, whether or not we could go back and relook at some uh, old offences from the mid-80s. One of the first crimes investigated with this new scientific cold case review was the Rotherham Shoe Rapist. All of the original crime scene physical evidence was still intact, kept in deep storage in one of the Forensic Science Service laboratories, alongside thousands of other cold cases. This series of um, sex offences was particularly interesting because unusually the police had kept some items so that was great for us because we actually had the original material to work with. When we first started looking at the materials together with the case notes we saw straight away that semen had been deposited during um, the various uh, incidents and for us we knew that would be a very good starting point in terms of trying to get a DNA profile using our advanced techniques. some of the other cases we for example uh, had some microscope slides of the actual original semen staining those were prepared originally to confirm the presence of semen and there's you know we didn't have a crystal ball in those days we didn't realize that these would have such fantastic potential later on and what we can do with these microscope slides is we can literally break open the seal and we can get to the dna that's under those microscope slides and get a profile that relates to the the semen that's actually on them one by one, the samples from three of the rape cases were analysed. We got the result back that uh, we did have a DNA profile for three of the uh, jobs and it was the same male offender that was responsible for uh, uh, three of the offences. After 15 years, the DNA analysis finally confirmed what the police had been thinking all along. 
that the rapes were all committed by the same man. Once you've actually got DNA, you know, you're very optimistic because you know that when you actually find the right person, uh, then you're going to prove the offences. So that really does give the inquiry an impetus to, uh, you know, to look under every stone and try and identify whose DNA it is. Armed with the DNA profile of the shoe rapist, the first line of inquiry for Sue and her team is to find a match by checking it against the National DNA Database. The database contains all significant crime-related DNA profiles collected in recent years. If the attacker has been convicted of a crime, his name would appear on the list and the police would have their man. DNA itself is a very complex molecule, much too complex from a forensic point of view for us to analyse all of it. So what we do in forensic science is we look at 10 areas of DNA that we know vary widely between individuals. Each DNA profile is unique. What the scientists see is a series of peaks which come in twos, one from the father and one from the mother. The relationship between each of these 10 peaks and 10 troughs creates a unique numerical sequence. So what we end up with is a series of 20 numbers plus an indication of whether you're a male or a female. And that is what the National Database is composed of. It's composed of strings of 20 numbers that are always being compared against each other. The police are confident that the shoe rapist DNA profile will appear on the database because he's likely to have committed other offences. You're really excited at that stage because you think, you know, you're going to get a hit. Uh, but unfortunately, in our case, we put it onto the database and we didn't actually uh, have a hit on it, so we still didn't know who the, uh, who the offender was. This is a setback. The police now have to return to the files and look for offenders known to be active in the 1980s. If they can get some names, then they can request a voluntary DNA sample. It's needle in the haystack police work. It might not find the shoe rapist, but it will eliminate the innocent. If you don't get a hit on the database, that's when the detective work really starts and you start working through various methods to try and identify whose DNA it is. The shoe rapist has evaded capture for more than 15 years. What the team need now is a breakthrough. It's 2001. For more than 15 years, the Rotherham shoe rapist has escaped to rest. The police now have a vital clue, the DNA profile of the attacker. But this hasn't given them the name of the rapist, so the South Yorkshire Police have relaunched a major inquiry. The work at that stage uh, was very much making sure that we hadn't uh, missed anything, reading all the original case papers, looking at the policy decisions that we'd made uh, initially, see so if there was anything that we could do uh, differently. At this stage, the police decided to build a picture of the attacker using criminal profilers. In cases like this, we use the profilers, um, uh, criminologists, to actually look at the statistically this type of offender, what sort of background are they normally from. What we were looking for were serious criminals because that's what the profiler expected our uh, offender to be. Uh, but uh, whilst they were serious criminals back in the 80s, they'd grown up, they were now married men with families of their own and uh, the bobbies now to them weren't the sort of people to be hated. They were people who they wanted to help because it could have been their daughter who was in this position. As Sue sets out to take DNA samples from known offenders, she has no idea that the profile is leading her in the wrong direction. June 2002, and the case is publicised with TV and press campaigns but they're getting no closer to a result. To be fair, by that stage, there was literally uh, me left and two detectives who came and assisted uh, as and when they could. And it just needed doing. If, uh, if we weren't going to uh, detect the crime, then you know, we needed to clear up all the loose ends so that in conscience we could say, well, we've done everything that we reasonably can. Once you've actually told 
your victims of these sort of offences that, uh, that you've got the DNA of the offender, the expectation because of TV programmes and everything else is that you're actually going to detect it after all this time. So to have to go back and tell the women that I'm sorry, yeah, we've got the DNA but we don't know whose DNA it is, is a horrendous thing to have to do because their expectation from very early on has been that you're finally going to give them some closure, you're finally going to tell them who it is. Over the next two years, as Sue spends hundreds of hours of her spare police time doggedly trying to track down the attacker, the Forensic Science Service has been developing a new search tool that would ultimately reveal the identity of the shoe rapist. We thought that it might be appropriate to, to try this, this tool out in this particular case alongside the, the other avenues that the police were exploring. And this tool is called familial searching and it exploits the fact that DNA is inherited. Familial DNA works because close relatives share similar DNA codes. Each parent passes their genetic material to their child. Brothers and sisters may also share a significant amount of DNA. A familial search of the national database looks for key similarities in the 20-digit DNA numerical sequence. Can the police find a relative of the shoe rapist on the database? We view this very much as soft intelligence, a little bit like um, if the police have an informant, that informant might give them some information which they will then go on and do some investigation. But the search list produces not just relatives, but random unrelated people who just happen to share similar DNA characteristics. So having done the familial search, this then generated a list of thousands of names. So that meant that Sue Hickman and her team certainly had their work cut out. The detectives must manually reduce the list through specific filters starting with ethnicity, age and geography. It relies heavily on the principle that criminals tend to offend in their local area. People from this area do tend to stay in this area, so we were fairly happy that we were going to find someone who was local to South Yorkshire, who was still in South Yorkshire, who would be uh, our offender. Starting in 2004 and working at night and in her spare time, it takes Sue two years to produce a shortlist of just five names of the most likely candidates. At that stage, it would need somebody to actually go out and knock on the door and actually speak to these individuals. The third address Sue called at led to the breakthrough she'd been waiting 20 years for, though at the time she was completely unaware of it. I was very, very, uh, very, very lucky. I mean, some people on those sort of inquiries can knock on hundreds of doors and still not get the, uh, the right one, but I'm a firm believer that you make your own look. And, you know, obviously uh, we worked hard on the inquiry. We did look uh, uh, under all the uh, stones just to see what was lurking there, and eventually we got the right stone. Name number three on Sue's list belonged to a woman who in 2000 had been convicted of a drink driving offence, which meant a DNA sample was automatically taken and added to the National DNA Database, where it sat for four years, until it was thrown up amongst many thousands as a possible familial match to the shoe rapist. I tell her why I've come, that her uh, relatives may or may not be involved in this, but not to worry about it, because that didn't mean to say that a family member of hers was the, uh, was the rapist, but what it did mean was we needed to eliminate them from the inquiry by going to see them and asking for a voluntary DNA sample. The woman explained she did have a brother called James Lloyd. He was a respectable member of society and so couldn't possibly be involved. She said they'd lost touch and didn't have his address. She did, however, have his telephone number. Because when Sue left, the woman made a call that was to start a remarkable chain of events. Obviously, I'd left the address, uh, and then she took uh, things uh, forward herself by then going on and ringing her brother. Just a few hours later, Barnsley police received an emergency call from a distressed woman, saying that she thought her brother was about to commit suicide. But she had no idea where he lived. The brother's name, James Lloyd. And Paul Booth, who was the acting sergeant on the day, he took the phone call, printed the incident off from the, uh, from the Comrade system, which is the incident system, and basically brought it through to me and, and just said, look, can you try and do some digging with this incident and find out where this guy lives? 
because it looks like, you know, he might be trying to commit suicide. With only a name and a general location to go on, PC Richard Revit applied a bit of old-fashioned police logic. I checked on our crime management system, uh, seeing if he'd ever been a victim of crime, and it, it transpired he'd actually had some garden ornaments stolen from his uh, garden uh, some time previously. So from that, I actually got a home address for him. An ambulance was dispatched immediately. When I first arrived, the ambulance had, had arrived probably very shortly before me. Mr Lloyd was walking around, he was obviously very drunk, um, and his son was there as well, trying to calm him down. Uh, the ambulance crew were trying to talk to Mr Lloyd, um, and at that point I started talking to him as well. I noticed that in the garage there was a, a rope on the floor, uh, and there was a step ladder uh, directly under a beam in the garage, and there were some packets of tablets and, and some paperwork lying around, which I later found out was what, what was the start of a suicide note. It would appear that his son had actually got him off, uh, you know, off the ladder, but it's quite obvious Mr Lloyd was very distressed. Everything was in place for him to commit suicide. It was probably minutes away from actually killing himself. The man was detained at Barnsley Hospital under the Mental Health Act. But what had triggered this response? When Lloyd heard the news from his sister that the police wanted a DNA sample, he began to panic. He then left work and went home where he made a number of phone calls to uh, uh, various people um, admitting that he'd done something uh, uh, horrendous in the past many years ago, uh, telling his father that he'd actually committed a rape many years ago. News of these phone calls were filtering through to PC Revit, who was waiting at the hospital. I'd spent four or five hours with Mr Lloyd um, and it was the little bits of information that we're getting from his family, even though they weren't telling exactly what had happened, it, it just led me to think, you know, that there's something obviously quite serious that he's done to somebody in the past. And he was just trying to link all those little bits up. So we didn't have a complete picture. And he was just trying to put that, the little bits together. Um, copper's hunch, intuition, call it what you will. I believed he'd committed a serious offence against a woman uh, sometime in the past. So at that point, I decided to actually arrest him on suspicion of a rape. Um, on a person unknown, uh, at a location unknown, approximately 20 years uh, before that date. Uh, and when I arrested him, I cautioned him, and he just looked straight at me and said, I knew that was coming. In handcuffs, James Lloyd was driven to Barnsley Police Station. And actually on the way to the police station, he looked at me and just made a comment completely unsolicited that said, I was a bastard 20 years ago. Could James Lloyd be the Rotherham shoe rapist? Was this the man police had been hunting for 20 years? For crimes committed in the UK. Suddenly we had potentially a serial killer. With witness accounts and expert testimony, gain a unique insight into Britain's most evil killers. Next on Pick. For more than 20 years, South Yorkshire police have been searching for a brutal rapist who terrorised the women of Rotherham. Despite years of police investigation, no suspect was ever found, until a breakthrough in DNA profiling led them straight to one man. James Desmond Benjamin Lloyd. Lloyd had been arrested shortly before midnight on the 29th of March 2006. When DS Sue Hickman arrived at work early the next morning, she was told by her senior officer they had the shoe rapist under lock and key. And my immediate reaction was, this is a wind-up, but it became quite clear that he was perfectly serious and that, uh, uh, to, that the, the shoe rapist was actually in the cells waiting for me. Uh, and that was just an amazing moment. It was just, it was unbelievable. You work uh, and you look under all these stones trying to find this uh, this individual. But when somebody actually says to you, yeah, you, you know, you've got them, uh, you've got them now, it really is quite, uh, quite a remarkable feeling. One of the things that we would need to do is get a DNA sample from, uh, from this individual. The sample was immediately rushed to a lab in London where it was compared to semen from three of the rapes. 
we were absolutely astounded after all the hard work that had gone in to find that his profile matched. This match meant the semen must have come from Lloyd. The probability of obtaining the same matching profile if the semen did not originate from James Lloyd was estimated to be one in a billion. With the DNA a perfect match, Sue finally had her man. After almost 20 years, thousands of hours of police time and hundreds of hours of her own time spent methodically sifting and re-examining the evidence, the shoe rapist was in custody. The victims were told the extraordinary news. I just couldn't believe it. After all these years, he ruined my life, and now it was his turn. Even a one in a billion DNA match is not enough for a conviction. The police now need to build a case based on hard facts and evidence. The DNA alone isn't good enough, you know, we need corroboration uh, that this is actually uh, the man, so uh, one of the basic things that uh, we do is actually search the uh, home address of these individuals or any other premises that are uh, uh, under their control where there could be uh, items uh, hidden. Uh, and we'd prepared a list of uh, the property that was outstanding uh, from these offences uh, so that the officers knew what they were actually uh, searching for. As the police began searching Lloyd's house, Detective Sergeant Andy Heptonstall was given the task of interviewing Lloyd. We went to Barnes Police Station where we met Mr Lloyd for the first time. Never seen the man before, seen a number of e-fits, which I must say bore a striking resemblance to him. They really did, uh, and it sort of brought the reality home of, of we've got the right guy. You have an image of um, a rapist, a serial brutal rapist, which is what he is. Um, uh, and this was not the image of the man uh, I would expect at all. He was a small man, he was uh, dishevelled at the time. Uh, obviously a broken man because uh, the reality of his crimes had, had come to haunt him and he had to face up to them now. When you're approaching an interview of a suspect for such sensitive offences, you've got to always consider the feelings of the victims and their family. And, and you're always conscious that these taped interviews may and probably will be played in, in the court, but when you're dealing with the man himself being interviewed, then you can't be shy, you can't be coy about it, you've got to get to the bare bones of the facts of the evidence and put them to him. No comment. No comment. No Throughout the interview, practically every question that was put to uh, Mr Lloyd was responded with either no comment or no reply. Lloyd may have been saying nothing, but the evidence being uncovered was speaking volumes. The home address was the first place that was actually uh, searched, uh, and from there we recovered uh, a number of items which indicated this was an individual who maybe had got a fetish for stiletto shoes, for stockings. Homemade pornographic videos were found at his house. The recurring theme was sadomasochistic sex and stiletto heels. Could these videos be evidence of why Lloyd suddenly stopped attacking women in 1986, around the same time he got married? Was Lloyd's wife as much a victim as any of the other women he'd attacked? Next, they searched his workplace, where they found evidence that shocked even the most experienced detective. Lloyd had worked at a local printer's for decades. It was here police found a trapdoor only he knew about. When he lifted the trapdoor uh, up inside, there was a crawl space that was used for uh, rewiring and things like that. And inside the crawl space, there were boxers and there were bin liners, uh, a vast amount of uh, property all stored actually uh, in there. No comment. In the interview room, Lloyd was still refusing to cooperate. There comes a time when we refer to uh, another statement that's given by the victim, it's called the victim personal statement. He was very strong. He tied my hands behind my back with some stockings. I struggled all the while. He sat on top of me and held my hands across my chest, put my coat over my face so that I couldn't see him. And these victim personal statements, it was apparent, were the uh, the things that, that Lloyd really did not appreciate or like in interview at all. 
it brought him to tears on occasions. But again, the questions were asked, why are you crying? And it would no comment. And the feeling was it wasn't tears for the victims, it was tears for himself. As Lloyd began to show signs of cracking in the interview, detectives started sifting through the piles of bags and boxes found in the crawl space at his work. One of the first things that we found was a silver charm bracelet, which is really unique. It's got a gramophone uh, uh, on it. It had got some, uh, some rings on it. This exact piece was stolen from the young woman during the 1984 Wickersley Road attack. When the officer came out and uh, said, you know, we, we found this, is this, uh, is this what you're looking for? You know, uh, again, that was another eureka moment. But the biggest shock came when all the bags were unpacked. There were over 120 high-heeled women's shoes. Some were brand new, but many had been worn. Lloyd claimed he'd bought them for his wife, but the victims immediately identified the pairs that were stolen from them by the rapist years before. It was a chilling moment, being confronted by things so long lost that would always be associated with their own brutal rape. Was Lloyd a fetishist who collected shoes? Or did each unclaimed pair represent an anonymous victim? The evidence against Lloyd was building. A photograph of him dating from the time of the attacks was discovered. It looks uncannily like his photo fit picture. Another photograph discovered showed Lloyd wearing a signet ring, identical to the one found at the scene of the Hatherley Road attack in 1986. Friends and family remember that Lloyd suddenly stopped wearing the ring around the time of the attacks. It was evident in some of the evidence that was recovered that he'd kept a track on the police investigation. Evidence in the form of uh, newspaper articles were found, which it was apparent Mr Lloyd had recovered and kept at the time to keep an eye on the investigation. And also, it, in the interview, it was apparent that he'd been researching the advances in DNA technology, uh, and, and he knew that on some of the scenes, he left DNA bearing material behind, which the police would be able to use at some point when the forensic science uh, made it available to us. As a chilling postscript, it was reported in the press that a pair of handcuffs were found in the glove compartment of Lloyd's work van. Could he have been planning more attacks? It changed a lot for interview. I could see the, the man that committed the offences coming out of him with the, the slightly cocky attitude being presented to myself and my colleague. And I said to him, uh, Jim, is there anything you want to take away from this interview and say or pass on to the victims or their families um, about these matters? And he coldly answered again, no comment, uh, which for me was disgraceful. Um, aside from everything else, I would have liked to have taken something from him that had come from him back to the victims for them to feel that this was a human being that committed the crimes and that there was some uh, emotion inside him and remorse for what he'd done. Even behind bars, Lloyd was still trying to escape justice. A failed suicide attempt at Hull Prison delayed his trial for months. Once we've actually charged him, we've got the DNA, the women are all, uh, they're all aware of uh, this. Um, whilst, you know, they knew we'd got uh, we'd got his DNA and it was definitely uh, him. The actual moment of him being charged with their offence was again very cathartic for uh, for them. And the next stage for them was they obviously wanted to go to uh, court. On the 17th of July 2006, Lloyd appeared at Sheffield Crown Court. By this stage, I've done my job, you know, I've got him there, I've got him to uh, court, and it's totally out of my uh, control, the judiciary then uh, take over. Judge Alan Golsack summed up the feelings of the whole court. These were the sort of rapes that are every woman's nightmare. They are terrifying offences, set upon by a stranger whilst walking home. All your victims described how your offences have changed their lives for the worst. They might well use the expression, ruin their lives. 
their sentences have already exceeded 20 years. The judge was absolutely amazing and all the women were, uh, I mean, that's all they talked about afterwards, you know, what an amazing uh, man he was because he'd actually summed up this case and he really had got the essence of the case. For a survivor of rape to finally have her day in court and have that formal acknowledgement that she was raped, she was telling the truth, um, and that the perpetrator is convicted is a hugely important and um, powerful experience which helps with the closure process. The trial lasted until September when Judge Golsack prepared to hand down his sentence. You could have cut the uh, air with a, with a knife. It was just so quiet, and you know, everybody was just waiting to see what was uh, what was actually gonna uh, gonna come out. Lloyd pleaded guilty to four counts of rape, two counts of attempted rape, and two further cases were allowed to remain on file. He was sentenced to life imprisonment. When he got life, they were just so satisfied because he'd taken their lives as far as the women were concerned, and and now he was losing uh, losing his. However, in 2007, Lloyd successfully appealed and his sentence was reduced. He could now be eligible for parole as early as 2014. Lloyd's case was one of the first to prove how vital DNA profiling can be in detecting cold cases. The Forensic Science Service is sitting on a massive gold mine of evidential material from, from days gone by, together with the associated case files. I certainly think that there'll be some offenders out there who have committed some very serious offences who should be starting to get very worried about the police coming and knocking on their doors now. For Sue Hickman, the case carries a very clear message to criminals. We might not come for you today, we might not come for you tomorrow, but we will be coming for you. And that's the right message to send. Let's transfer that fear from these women to the person who should be feeling that fear, knowing that one of these days we're going to be coming and actually knocking on their door and holding them to account for the things that they've done in the past.